empowered by the Covenant Nation. The like to just desire to be born again and to go and live in the Second is to make you a Liverpool fan. Honestly, like for those of us who are football agnostic, club agnostic, you just feel like Liverpool is the place to be. But you know, like we said something at the beginning of this platform and even in our promotions, that this is one of the most, it's going to be the most direct and instructive platforms we've ever had. So if you don't have your writing material right now, you are wrong. You know, we've, we've just received six powerful lessons. Stay focused. Don't overcompensate for your sufferings. That was like enough to just go home. So please just make sure, and like we said, those of us who are in the live audience here, it's our responsibility to make sure that those who are at home feel, feel left out, not left out, included. I, I said it's the opposite, to feel included. And if you're online as well, please go ahead and share these wonderful things uh, that you're hearing. Our second speaker for today, I'll bring her up quickly, is Yvonne Johnson. She is the co-founder and CEO of Indicina, a fintech infrastructure startup focused on Africa. She's a strategic thinker with a demonstrated ability to influence real change by leveraging innovative solutions. She comes with over a decade of leadership experience, supporting executive management on strategy within financial services. Most recently, Yvonne led the strategy team of a tier one Nigerian banking group. She received her MBA at the Kellogg School of Management, where she graduated on the Dean's List and was a recipient of the Donald P. Jacobs International Scholarship. An honors graduate of the University of Toronto, her previous work experiences include investment banking at Merrill Lynch, diamond management and technology consultants, as well as a community lab in New York where she worked as the director of process and execution strategy. Yvonne is also an early stage investor and advisor in pan-African technology st startups, notably Andela and Flutterwave. Please join me as I welcome to the platform once again, Yvonne Johnson. Let me just say Yvonne Johnson was on the platform last time. So when you, invite, when you get invited to the platform back to back, you know there's a deep well that we need to tap from. So welcome with a warm applause, a louder, louder applause, Yvonne. Is this working? Thank, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and uh, happy Workers' Day. I hope everybody can hear me properly. Thank you. So today's topic, it really is about building a successful business in today's climate. Um, but specifically, the twist to the topic is about living local and thinking global. Um, and this is something that's probably been, you know, um, driven by, you know, um, the last couple of years with the pandemic. Successful entrepreneurs have mastered the art of possibility thinking. They imagine a different world, and they inspire a team that executes these ideas. In practical terms, they're able to create economic value, which we need as a society to function. But the challenge today is that how do you continue to create value when there's still ongoing disruption? So it's great we're back together physically, but there's still spikes with the pandemic. Um, global supply chains haven't really recovered. Um, and of course, there's a war that's ongoing, and that has also brought disruption um, as well. But every crisis creates winners and losers. We all know of a business that did not survive. Um, but then we also know of businesses that, yes, they did survive, uh, but they're shells of themselves. They, they've, they've significantly shrunk. And for those of us that did survive, how do we extend this trajectory of success? How do we ensure that it's not just luck you know, that allows us to survive? And my discussion would focus today on four ideas as we think about, for us as entrepreneurs, founders, and even business professionals, four ideas that you need to appreciate to drive success in business, to start to think global, as the topic um, says. But the thing is that, see, a lot of these ideas, we hear them all the time, right? You know, we've heard them before, right? But see, the difference for you today is that you need to apply each point to your use case. That's where the real value is. 
How does each idea, you know, four points, six points, eight points, each of the different speakers are going to have ideas. But then the idea is that you then need to start to integrate it into your specific use case. And my first point is to understand that all of your business drivers are now global. So technology enabled a virtual world. You know, we had the pandemic, we couldn't have physical interaction. And technology allowed this virtual world to exist. And what that meant is that physical interactions were replaced by Zoom, MixLR, YouTube, right? Digital payments for us as business replaced cash, right? Because that was no longer an option. But see, one of the interesting things is that once you start to live virtually, physical borders are no longer an issue. You don't really think about them as much. They are not this limitation to your business or even to your career. And that has two major impacts on your business. One is that now all the threats are now global. Competition is not limited to a fixed radius. Before, you had a product, you had a service, you were offering it to a set of customers locally. It was yourself that offered this product and the guy down the road. Now, marketplaces are more global and they're accessible. So your customer has seen your product. He's seen the product of the person down the road. But he's also seen the product of a foreign vendor. And that now becomes an option to the person. And the thing with foreign competition, when you think about them as threats to your business, is that sometimes they're able to even benefit from regulatory arbitrage. Because remember, it's now a virtual world that we're now all comfortable living, living in. And so geographical borders are no longer a limitation. And so that now becomes a threat to your business, and then you have to start to think about how do you mitigate that. The other thing, too, is that your talent pool is now global. And that is very important. It's probably even one of the more critical things. All of your staff have active LinkedIn profiles that are now accessible to every recruiter globally. You go on LinkedIn, you see your finance manager's profile. She has a new picture. She's upgraded the picture. She's packaged herself. Finance manager with the ability to increase revenues by 30%. And you're thinking, ah, we need to hire this person. Oh wait, that's your finance manager. And so you're looking at that profile, and every recruiter globally is looking at that profile. I run a business, I, and it's a fintech, so we have a lot of engineers. And, I, and talent is important, and we're going to talk about it. And I'm on LinkedIn because you know, you're looking for talent. And I noticed a recruiter from Microsoft in Seattle. And she has a post that says she's looking for engineers, um, and, you know, um, she's looking for engineers, and so anybody that can refer it. And my engineer said, I'm interested. I'm interested, you know? So again, that's what it is, right? So your talent, the talent pool is now global. And that has implications for you as a business and even for you as a corporate uh, professional. Because again, remember, a virtual world relaxes geographic borders. Now, on the flip side, your opportunities are also global. And that also has implications. And that's also things that you now need to start to you know, exploit. You know, Nigerian businesses were more comfortable as consumers of foreign services. It's something that's comfortable to us. You know, our structures and our frameworks are usually in place. Um, but now you should start to think about supplying your products to a global audience where you're not just consuming it, but then you're able to offer it to it. Because again, it's a virtual world, geographic borders um, have been relaxed, and you done, now have technology that enables all of that. It's now easier for you to sell into a global market. You know, you have social media profiles that are global, with a global audience, so you can market your product. People can know what you're offering. Digital payments technology, it's now easy and possible to be able to collect in any foreign currency. Even logistics is now able to do more. And when you think of going back to the issue of talent, when you put out the job description, it should not just be limited to the people locally. You're looking for a finance manager, you're looking for an engineer. Your job descriptions now, you should have a global audience looking at it. So again, while the threats are now global, but there are also significant opportunities that are also global. The same technology that enabled the virtual world should be your crowbar to capture new opportunities for your business. And that's the power of technology. So then you then ask yourself, 
What does your business look like if you think beyond Nigeria? What's possible if the next customer or the next employee is not within a fixed radius? How does that transform your business? And again, as a, career, uh, um, as a senior professional, as a career professional, start to think beyond just you know, a limited border. You know, the second point is really around talent. Because again, as businesses, talent is a very important input. And that talent pool now is global. You have to start to think as a business about the impact of a global, highly mobile talent pool on your business. We've talked about it. You're an entrepreneur, you're a business leader. Your primary role is carrying a vision. But you need a team to execute because you can't do it all. You need to be able to inspire a set of people to execute towards that goal. That role hasn't changed. What has changed, though, is that the rules of work have changed. Employ employees are no longer kind of passive stakeholders. In a sense, they are now customers. And so what you have to say as a business is that what is your value proposition to them? As a customer, what are they buying from you when they come and they you know, agree to come and be on your team? And how do you ensure that you are constantly delivering value? And there are different ways that these are, this is showing up. For example, you know, nowadays people can say, I don't want to come into the office five days a week. And so can you offer enough flexibility so that your best managers can have this hybrid structure? Because otherwise, it's a global talent pool. Recruiters from Seattle want them as well, and that's now an option to them. If you're in technology, and all of us should be, right, you know, in, in the sense that we all should be applying technology in terms of our businesses, most software engineers want the option of multiple jobs. There's an incredible demand for software engineering. Can you afford to insist on exclusivity? What does that mean for your business when you now have to open it up to employees that say, we don't want this exclusivity? And then another example is, you know, how do you attract a candidate where money is not their primary uh, motivating factor? Before you are recruiting, you put out a job description, you interview, you get the finalist, you negotiate a salary, how much do you want, 100? Okay, I'll be generous, I'll give you 125. But that's not, that's not the primary factor. They start to ask you questions and there's, like I said, they are now an important stakeholder. And there is a value proposition that you have to offer to them. You know, there's a concept at play, right? Small pool, large hunter. Yesterday's global cha champions that you are vying to hire are now today's global candidates. Because again, we're now more comfortable living in a virtual world. You don't have to work for somebody that is in that fixed radius. That's the kind of competition, and that's the, that's the same talent pool that you are vying from. And technology also, and then you also have to think about it both ways, right? You know, being very open to having talent on your team that is in a different geography. And again, technology enables that. There are global, payroll, there are global HR and payroll systems that allow you to hire somebody in a different country, they're working for you, you adjust the time zones, and then you handle every, and, and those platforms handle everything around um, you know, HR management and payroll. The next point to think about, again, is when we think about our customers. These are very important stakeholders for our business. And one of the things to really think about is that how do you rethink the customer experience? Do you recognize exactly what your customer is purchasing from you? Do you recognize what the demand really is? Because it's not the same. People's expectations have changed. We've all reprioritized our lives. You know, things that were important before are not so important now. And so you really have to think about that from a customer perspective. You can't just assume that they came to you, they bought this product because they're using it for this, that, and the other, right? You have to rethink that customer experience. And what it also does is it, it also allows you to create new product and service experiences. Also, it means that sometimes it could also mean that your existing product portfolio is now obsolete. So again, it's really just to say, what is that customer experience? What does that demand look like? You know, for example, somebody, you, you have a store, and somebody comes to you and says, I need to put a hole in the wall. Can you offer me something that does that? And you say, okay, yes, I sell hammers. There's a big hammer, there's a small hammer, there's a drill, 
this drill is very, it's very good, you know, it's, it's electronic and it can give you a big hole, a small hole, right, you know. But then if you start to ask questions and start to inquire, why does he want a hole in the wall? Well, you know, he wants to put up a picture. Okay, what kind of picture? Well, now I'm working from home, I have a home office, I want a picture of my family. And that now becomes the difference between I am selling you a hammer versus I'm selling you an experience. It, it becomes, becomes completely different. And the people that can speak to that experience would win that customer. There's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting um, story that I saw on Instagram, the whole idea of home bartenders. Um, and so there was this guy during the pandemic, and he's a bartender. I mean, it doesn't get more physical than that. You know, his job requires him to be in a physical location, interacting with people, offering them drinks. And during the pandemic, in the heat of the pandemic, you're not able to do that. I mean, even if you could sneak around and go around the restrictions and get to the bar, nobody's coming. So he's at home, right? Um, and then what he then did was then start to offer home bartending services, where he was then packaging his recipes for his drinks, his cocktails, um, and mailing them out to people. And so again, it's the idea of kind of rethinking the experience, rethinking the product portfolio, your products and your services. Now those instructions were probably, you know, in the training manual, you know, while he was, you know, still in the physical location. Um, you know, his customers never saw it. They just came, they asked for a drink, and he, he made it for them. You know, it was probably down at the bar. Now he's been able to repurpose that, and that becomes a new product, a new service, right? Because the old one is now obsolete. Um, Office furniture, right? For example, if you're in the furniture business, right? Before you were selling office furniture, maybe the demand for that has shrunk, you know? Not as much people, I mean, now we're back into the office, but again, you know, there's been disruptions in that, right? But people are now having home offices, right? You know, even though we're back in the office, people still have home offices. Can you repurpose, you know, your old products and, and services to now meet this new demand? So again, it's just rethinking the customer experience. What does that demand really look like? Do not make assumptions that it's just the old way of doing things, right? Because those are the opportunities for you to be able to have success. One, and the next point, and my last point really, is about, and it's also an important one, and I think about it, you know, the, the, the issue of talent is very important. You can't really get around that. And I think for, for a lot of people that has been kind of, you know, a major uh, disruption into their business and that they've not been able to recover from. But another thing too is that even when you do this exercise and then you make these changes and then you know, you're able to put yourself on this trajectory of success, how do you institutionalize innovation? So your business survived, you're still standing, and again, like I said, you know, how do you make sure it's not just luck? Because when we think about businesses, you know, I always say that they're living, breathing beings, right? You know? And momentum is important for a business. You need to be able to make sure that that momentum is there in your business. Otherwise, it's a slow bleed to death, right? Because businesses and organizations, they're living, breathing beings, right? You read a lot about history, about organizations that have lasted long, long time, um, for, for, for long periods of time, and you realize that they've just been able to keep that momentum up. And for those that had the decline, they were just not able to. And so even when you make these changes and now you're on a path of you know, success and now you have this trajectory of success, things are happening, you're selling to a global audience, you need to ensure that you're institutionalizing this growth mindset because momentum is what is gonna guarantee survival. You can't take that for granted. And it's also linked to the point about business drivers being global, right? You know? And so it's, it's about saying that how do you adopt a growth mindset within the business? How do you ensure that you're institutionalizing these things and they are also become part of the culture? And you're ensuring that events don't just happen to you. And there's a, there's a number of ways to think about it. Number one, again, is back to talent. They're an incredible source of fresh thinking. You know, simple things like even within your organization, being able to make cross-functional teams, um, you know, a culture and a norm. There's a particular project, you know, maybe primarily it's a finance project or it's an HR product. So prim um, before it was just the finance people or the HR people that were on the team. Now you start to think about cross-functional ideas because talent is an incredible source of fresh thinking or fresh ideas, you know. Also the point about hiring your core, um, outside of your core industry, right, you know. You're in transportation or you're in FMCG. 
you are looking for a product manager, you're looking for a finance manager. Um, and then when you put your JD out, you're looking for traditional people, right? Thinking of, think about hiring from outside of the industry, right? You know, they may not have the domain knowledge of your industry, but that's your um, strength. You can teach them that, right? So consider hiring because that then is a source of fresh thinking. So again, as you start to think about these things, you want to institutionalize them. You want to make them a part of your culture. And talent is an incredible source of fresh thinking. And so the idea of constantly having cross-functional teams within the organization, hiring from outside the organization, that's a way to start to institutionalize that and make sure that that complacency doesn't step in. You know? The other thing, too, is that you know, when you operate on a global standard, you know, back to the idea of, of thinking global, of reimagining your business, you know, outside of a fixed geography. One of the things that operating on a global standard does is that it forces a higher quality output. You're interacting with more people in more places, and that innovation spreads quicker. Because if you're just in a fixed location, a fixed set of people, you get used to the demand, you get used to you know, their experiences, you don't allow this kind of fresh thinking and fresh idea comes in. But when you open yourself up, especially to a global audience, it's a way to ensure that that innovation spreads quicker. And what has done it historically is that it has produced a higher quality output. You know, practically as well is that, you know, stopping to assess, you know, a lot of kind of buzzwords that are out there, right? You know, distributed workplaces and remote working and things like that. Again, trying to integrate it into your business and making sure that, you know, you're really getting the impact from it. Because ideas come, ideas go, right? You know, you hear a lot of good ideas, you hear a lot of great ideas. But, you know, the, 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 the idea becomes, goes from being a good idea to a great idea when you integrate it into your own specific use case. So yes, yeah, so being able to institutionalize innovation, create a growth mindset within your business, make sure that it's a culture, that's how you create that momentum, right? Because again, businesses are living, breathing beings, right? You, know, you don't want to get into that place of complacency and start that slow decline downwards, right? You know, so putting all of this together, you know, just starting to conclude, right? You know, again, successful entrepreneurs, right? I mean, that's what they know how to do. It's possibility thinking. It's reimagining a new world and inspiring a team towards that, right, you know. But we have periods of disruptions, right? We've seen a major one, we're still going through one, right, you know. And the rules of work have changed. So you as an entrepreneur, success for you, it's still about reimagining a new world. It's still about inspiring people to do it, right, you know. But now you have to do it with a lot of ongoing disruption and where the rules are changing, right, you know. Operating on a global standard. Technology has enabled that, right, you know. Your, your, your business is not just within a fixed geography. Your customers, your talent pool, it's not within a fixed geography. So it's starting to operate at that global standard, right? Because all of your business drivers are global. And so you have no option. And again, there is the advantage that operating on that global standard forces a high, higher quality output, right? You know? Talent. It's a global talent pool, right? You know, that same talent pool, it's now a smaller talent pool, and they're now bigger hunters, right? You know? So talent and employees, they're now a key stakeholder. You need to upgrade the value proposition to them because they have more options. And even for you as a business, because we know talent is a source of fresh thinking, also looking to cross-pollinate within your business, right? We talked about looking at the customer experience, reviewing your product offering, specifically, in, um, specifically interrogating what that customer demand is. Don't make assumptions about what it is, right? Interrogate it, right? What are people's new priorities? Why does he want a hole in the wall, right? So that it's a difference between just selling him a fancy hammer versus selling him an experience. And lastly, institutionalizing innovation. Ensuring that you have this framework for creating that momentum. Ensuring that you don't get into that place of complacency. Ensuring that when the next disruption comes, those events don't just happen to you. Because you've institutionalized these things, growth mindset is now part of your culture, and then you've now been able to have success. But not just success at a local level, but success at a global level. Thank you. Live local. Thank you so much.